Hello, welcome. We begin our new adventure, island hopping across the Outer Hebrides. And that's episode one today, so are you sitting comfortably? Then we'll begin. The Western Isles of Scotland were our journey's destination from the north of England. Specifically, we were to go island hopping across the Outer Hebrides, driving and catching ferries. These are a chain of more than 100 small islands, some 70 kilometres west from mainland Scotland. We got a ferry from Oban on the west coast and it took about nearly five hours um, to get there on the car ferry. The main islands we were going to go to were called Barra, Eriskay, North and South Uist, Benbecula, Grimsay, Bernaray, Harris and Lewis. You'll notice that uh, AY is often on the end of a number of these islands. The A suffix is derived from the Old Norse for Ireland. There is much evidence of Neolithic settlements and some fantastic ancient places to visit. But later in the 8th and 9th centuries, um, Celtic and Norse influences became strong and enduring in these islands. There were fierce Vikings with names like Harold Fairhair and Kettle Flatnose, and they made Viking raids. Actually, the earliest mention of the Outer Hebrides was by the Greek historian Diodorus Siculus in 55 BC. He wrote that there was an island called Hyperborea, which means far to the north, where a round temple stood, from which the moon appeared only a little distance above the earth every 19 years. And this would seem to be referring to the stone circle at Kalanish, which you'll see we visited later. Pliny the Elder, also mentioned it, so there seems to have been some contact even with ancient Rome and, and Greek uh, civilizations. In the 6th century, St Columba brought Celtic Christianity to the islands and the islands finally came under Scottish rule in 1266 by the MacDonald clan. In the early 19th century, a horrific thing happened where the British government enforced the Highlands and Islands clearances, destroying communities, evicting humans in favour of sheep and causing great devastation and hardship. Today the islands are sparsely inhabited and they're a haven of natural peace and tranquillity. Although frequently battered by strong winds, there's nothing really between them and America. So uh, they don't have many trees either. And there are many Gaelic musicians rooted here and they play the traditional island's walking songs. You may know the music Fingal's Cave Overture. Mendelssohn composed that while he was in the Hebrides. The sea life and wildlife abound here. Minky whales, basking sharks, seals, porpoise and dolphin. And seabirds include sea eagles, puffins and gannets, golden eyes and kittiwakes. And then there are the gorgeous moors, which they call machair, which is kind of uh, grassland, moorland by the shore. And this is uh, where spring flowers abound and also the purple bell heather and cotton grass. And you can actually smell this wonderful perfume of the wild flowers 
while you're out at sea. There are narrow roads, not many of them, unadorned, as I say, by trees or many buildings. And they go pretty straight across the land. And there are causeways that carry them across the many inlets where waves may sometimes play at your wheels. So it's the back of beyond, the middle of nowhere, away from it all, however you see it. The Hebridean, the outer Hebridean Isles are nothing like we normally experience. Just miles and miles of beauty, wilderness, wildlife, and no advertising. This makes us realise just how continually bombarded we are normally with the consumer society. You must have one of these, you must do this, you must go here. People treated as consumers from whom cash must be extracted constantly for things we, we do not need. But not here, in the Outer Hebrides, these islands. All there is here is the sea, the salt water and fresh water locks, the sky, the local communities, living as best they can from the fruits of the sea and the land. These Hebrideans are civilised in the true sense, softly spoken, friendly but not flashy. The only flashy thing here is the sun glinting on the waves. We stayed on Barra for the first night at the old schoolhouse at North Bay. David and Diana could not do enough for us and everything was perfect. I read through the logbook of the school from the 1830s when it seemed that the teachers were always trying to get the children of the island to attend while their parents preferred to have the children working collecting the kelp, digging potatoes or cockling. The other enemy of regular school attendance was ill health. Fevers and illnesses such as measles and whooping cough regularly swept the islands during the 1800s, laying families low and causing the medical officer to close the school for a few weeks at a time. Lastly, there was the weather. Often the gales and rain or winter snow meant that children were kept home. This was all hard to imagine as we slept in this very same schoolhouse, which had now been beautifully converted into a warm and luxurious bed and breakfast. After a breakfast of porridge, we visited Barra, well, airport, you can't really call it that. It's actually the beach at Cockle Strand and only in between the tides. A small plane of the type with propellers appeared in the sky and came in to land on the beach. Probably takes, I don't know, about 12 to 20 passengers. As it landed, its wheels kicked up the spray on the beach. The passengers entered no more than a hut to register their arrival. And all around was sand, sea, sky, and low granulated hills with golden grasses beyond waving in the salty wind. We then drove on to the small island of Vatasai linked by a causeway, as so many of the islands are now. There's a sign at each end of the causeway, picturing the profile of an otter, with the words, Caution, Otters Crossing. Unfortunately, we didn't see one, but they are there. Vatasay has two long, arced beaches of white sand, which gives the sea a light green hue near the shore <clears throat> as the white foamed waves roll in. 
We sat in the blissful peace of that wild and beautiful beach. I was meditating for a while, cross-legged, on the silvery sand. Paul sculpted the sand into just the right sitting position. It was practically deserted, save for three children paddling and playing some elaborate game of their own creation. They seemed to need nothing else. We never heard the phrase, I want, from them, as two women with them sat further up the beach, reading without interruption. We strode over a steep meadow to the other side of the island, to the sister beach. This had strong, heavy waves battering in from America and the wind tore at your head. The next day we took a small ferry that rolled and bobbed its way to Eriskay. Eriskay, the name is from the Viking Old Norse language and it means Eric's Isle. It has a population of about 200 people and is three miles long and one and a half miles wide. We then drove across the causeway to South Uist. I was struck by the golden hues in the grasses on South Uist, which gave them a care, the flat grassy shore, such a glow. Green and golden, Dylan Thomas would have said. There is nothing and no one there, or at least that's how it seems. Just many fingers of water everywhere. Wading birds of every type explore the shore as the tide recedes. Oyster catchers with long red beaks. A whole flock of curlews on a rocky promontory on North Uist huddled against the wind. I watched them through binoculars and marvelled at the incredible length of their slender curved beaks. Smaller birds, plovers, excavated among the pools and the kelp. We stayed on a small island called Grimsey, connected to North Uist. The bed and breakfast overlooked a working harbour and was run by Mrs MacLeod, an elderly lady, dignified and friendly, with neatly permed grey hair. Her husband worked on his prize garden, every kind of flower and bush, but battered by the gales quite often. We went to Langas, a hill overlooking a picturesque sea lock, and climbed a boggy mountain, which never got any drier as we ascended. We were in search of an ancient chambered burial cairn. The gale pulled at our clothes as we hopped across the blooming purple heather, trying to avoid the waterlogged peaty hollows everywhere. Despite the late summer, there was still a myriad of small white and yellow flowers among the grasses. These islands have many wild flowers, harebells and orchids, daisies and primroses and so many more. The beautiful Macaire in summer is a carpet of mixed wild flowers of all colours that simply take your breath away and the beautiful heady perfume of them. You just stand there with the wind in your hair and you feel so connected to nature and to the earth. We got up to the cairn at the top, a huge pile of stones in an igloo shape with an entrance made of slabs of stone which had been put there between 5,000 and 6,000 years ago. They have remained there ever since. Now with bunches of deep purple heather all around and above the entrance. We bent down 
and shone a torch inside. We saw the slabs of stone separating the burial chambers, but declined our guidebook invitation to scrabble inside. After sheltering, with some relief there from the strong winds raging above the cairn, we set off again, jumping over the bogs to the top of the hill where a trig point stood. We stood there slowly turning round to the panoramic vista, miles and miles at every side of locks, little fjords, hills, mountains and the sea. We were lucky that despite the gales, the sky was quite clear and visibility was good. The sky always seemed so much bigger and closer in these wild areas. Your eyes are drawn to it and the movement of the clouds. We started descending on the other side of the hill picking out barely discernible tracks through the spongy soaked land. Fortunately we had waterproof walking boots. Nearly at the bottom we rounded the bend and saw the small stone circle of Finn's people. Not a soul around anywhere. We were just alone in this place of wilderness. And that's the end of episode one. So do join me again tomorrow at four o'clock UK time and we'll go for episode two. Thanks so much for being here. See you later.